Hey everyone, this lesson is on atopic dermatitis, otherwise known as eczema. So in this lesson, we're going to talk about what atopic dermatitis is. We're also going to talk about the atopic triad. We're also going to discuss risk factors for this condition. We're also going to talk about how we can make the diagnosis and what we can do to treat it. So atopic dermatitis is a chronic autoimmune pruritic inflammatory skin condition. So those are three or four very key words to remember. It's chronic, it's autoimmune, it's pruritic, and it's inflammatory. Again, this condition is also called eczema, and it's so prevalent that approximately 5 to 20% of children worldwide are affected with this condition, and it often uh, has an onset during childhood as well. Now, atopic dermatitis, for whatever reason, has a predilection for affecting skin creases and flexure surfaces. So key points, again, from this are that it's chronic autoimmune puritic inflammatory skin condition and it affects the skin creases and flexure surfaces. So atopic dermatitis is associated with other conditions as well. We call this the atopic triad. And the atopic triad is the associated conditions that start with the letter A. And they all have an association with increased levels of immunoglobulin E. Now, the atopic triad conditions include atopic dermatitis, allergic rhinitis, and asthma. And atopic dermatitis is associated strongly with allergic rhinitis and asthma. And it's been estimated that approximately 80% of individuals with atopic dermatitis will develop either allergic rhinitis or asthma or both. And the other A condition that I like to kind of keep in mind as well is other allergies or other allergic reactions. Atopic dermatitis patients have a predilection for having food-induced allergic reactions like urticaria. So it's approximately 10 to 20% will have some issues with allergies to foods as well. And having a very early onset of atopic dermatitis within the first three months of life is associated with other specific allergies uh, to foods like egg, milk, and peanuts. So these are just some key things to take from the slide and things to remember. So what causes atopic dermatitis in the first place? So the pathogenesis of atopic dermatitis involves two separate categories. The first is a defective epidermal barrier. So this makes sense. Atopic dermatitis is an issue with the skin, and this is a uh, epidermal barrier is your skin. So it's something that is defective with this. And it's actually related to a protein known as filaggrin. And with regards to atopic dermatitis, often cases will have a filaggrin deficiency. And there are also some issues with protease, antiprotease activity imbalance. There are some issues with the proteins calocrine and uh, L-E-K-T-I. And there are also some tight junction abnormalities in the skin as well. These all can lead to a defective epidermal barrier. The second main category of pathogenesis is an immune dysregulation. Again, this makes sense. We talked about it before. It's an autoimmune condition. So there are, we'll break down the immune dysregulation into innate immune system and adaptive immune system. With regards to the innate immune system, there are reduced TLR2 and TLR9 function. And with regards to the adaptive immune system, there's actually increased expression of Th2, Th17, and Th22 cytokines. So these are the two main areas where the pathogenesis of atopic dermatitis begins. Defective epidermal barrier, and then there's also this immune component. These don't all have to happen to have atopic dermatitis, but they're all related and they're all associated with, uh, with the onset and the symptomatology of atopic dermatitis. So we've talked about the pathogenesis of atopic dermatitis, but what are some of the triggers and what are some of the risk factors and what are some of the protective factors against atopic dermatitis? So we're going to look at the influencing factors first. The first one I want to talk about is family history. This is a generally a pretty big risk factor. Generally speaking, approximately 70% of individuals with atopic dermatitis have a positive family history. If you have one parent, you have a certain percentage uh, risk. And if you have two parents, you even have a higher risk of having atopic dermatitis. The second one is associated with the uh, family history. Again, genetics. If there's a loss of function mutation of the filaggrin gene we talked about earlier, this has a pretty strong um, 
pretty strong risk of having atopic dermatitis. Also having allergies. Again, we talked about the atopic dermatitis. Uh, atopic triad. We also talked about associated allergies. If you do have allergies, they're, because of the associations, you're more likely to have atopic dermatitis as well or develop it. Fourth one is quite interesting, and this one is actually environmental water sources. So there has been some evidence to show that having uh, the hardness, and so minerals and those types of things in water can actually worsen or be a trigger for atopic dermatitis. And generally speaking, we talk about calcium carbonate when we talk about the hardness of the environmental water source. And the protective factors, so we've talked about the influencing factors. Now the protective factors um, are the following. The first one is early daycare. So if you get your child in daycare early on in life, this seems to be protective against developing atopic dermatitis. Again, you're getting into an environment where you're sharing a lot of germs. You're getting a, you're getting exposure to a lot of um, a lot of allergens. Those types of things that can actually be uh, helpful for protecting against atopic dermatitis. The second one is exposure to pets. So having pets can actually help reduce your risk for atopic dermatitis. And the third one is actually exposure to farm animals. This all leads into the same uh, type of uh, thing you're getting exposed to different types of allergens and you're generally uh, training your immune system to be less of that immune dysregulation we talked about earlier and this leads into the hygiene hypothesis in in that having a very controlled hygienic environment can actually increase the risk of having allergies and associated conditions like atopic dermatitis. So atopic dermatitis can have characteristic skin findings that we call atopic stigmata. And these can include keratosis polaris or hyperkeratosis polaris. This is colloquially called chicken skin. So it's essentially little raised uh, red dots that can uh, develop on uh, different parts of the body. You can also see what we call Denny Morgan fold. So you can see here in this image, this wrinkling effect and some, some change in the skin color as well underneath the eyes. You can also get what we call Hertogies sign. Uh, I know I'm not pronouncing this properly, but it's either Hertogies or Hertog's sign. And this is essentially a uh, absence or thinning of the lateral eyebrow. So you can see in this image here. Another skin finding is what we call pityriasis elba. Pityriasis elba is essentially a whitening of the skin color or skin tone in certain parts of the body, as you can see in this image on this patient's face. So what happens generally is that if you have atopic dermatitis or eczema in certain parts of the body for a long time, it can actually cause scarring of that, that uh, skin and it leads to a whitened or a lighter skin tone or skin color. So that is pityriasis elba. Another one is palmar hyperlinearity. So if you were to look at a patient's hand, you can essentially see way more palmar lines on their hand. And this is what we call palmar hyperlinearity. This is a this could be a skin finding in atopic dermatitis. And another one is something we call retroauricular fissuring. So retroauricular fissuring, retro behind auricular with regards to the ear. So behind the ear you get this fissuring. So if you were to pull back on your ear and look behind your ear you can see this kind of almost like a chafing or a, uh, a scarring type effect. And this is again associated with atopic dermatitis and this can be a skin finding with regards to atopic dermatitis. So, so these are some of the skin findings we can see with atopic dermatitis. So how do we make the diagnosis? Well, the diagnosis of atopic dermatitis is generally a clinical one. And from what we've seen before, we can make the clinical diagnosis if we see, you know, pyritic, erythematous skin lesions in skin folds and flexural surfaces. And if you see a lot of those other atopic stigmata we talked about before, we could essentially make a clinical diagnosis of this condition. However, there's also a more objective criteria-based diagnosis we can use as well from a United Kingdom working group. So I generally like this one. Um, so with this, re with this diagnosis, it's more of an objective uh, checklist-based type of diagnosis. So with regards to this diagnosis, 
um, what we need is one mandatory and three other criteria. So the mandatory condition we need, absolutely need to make this diagnosis is that these skin lesions need to be puritic. So they need to be itchy. And then once you have that, once we say these skin lesions are puritic, we need three or more of the following. The first one is that skin creases are involved. So you have the anticubital fossas involved, the popliteal fossa, the neck around the eyes. So a lot of those areas we talked about before. Or we need a history of asthma or hay fever. This ties into the atopic triad. Or we need a presence or uh, presence of generally dry skin within the past year. And generally we need the symptoms to begin before the age of two. And we need visible dermatitis involving flexural surfaces. So these skin lesions need to be puritic. And then we need three of the following. Skin creases involved, a history of asthma or hay fever, uh, generally dry skin over the past year, symptoms beginning before the age of two, and visible dermatitis involving flexural surfaces. So if you have three or more of those with pur puritis, then we can make the diagnosis of di atopic dermatitis. So that's how we can make the diagnosis of atopic dermatitis, but just recognize that a lot of times uh, clinicians might not use this uh, diagnosis criteria and they will just simply diagnose it clinically. So once we make the diagnosis, how do we treat it? Treatment in generally involves, we want to avoid the allergens in the triggers that can make or cause a flare of atopic dermatitis or make it worse. These can include heat or low humidity environments. You also want to reduce stress and anxiety. These can be triggers as well. The next thing we want to do is we want to avoid certain foods. So there is some controversy with regards to this. Some clinicians believe that um, eating certain foods can actually uh, induce or worsen atopic dermatitis. Some clinicians don't think that at all. So there's this question of, you know, dairy products specifically. Having dairy in your diet, does this worsen atopic dermatitis? You're going to hear certain things. You're going to hear from other people. And what I'm going to say here is that think about this as something that you can remove from your diet to see if it'll actually help with these symptoms. And then if these don't work, if the avoidance of certain triggers and certain foods and allergens don't work, we can move on to treatments. And the treatments can include topical corticosteroids. So an example is about 2.5% uh, of hydrocortisone cream. Another one we can use is we can use topical calcineurin inhibitors. And topical calcineurin inhibitors are generally used when you need to use the steroids on the face or the eyelids or the neck or the skin folds. And the reason for this is because using corticosteroids for a long time in uh, these areas like the face and eyelids and skin folds can lead to thinning of the skin. And we don't want that. So if you're needing to use steroids in these areas of the body, you can think about actually changing to a topical calcineurin inhibitor. And then for severe disease, we can think about using photo, phototherapy. So phototherapy can be helpful for severe cases of atopic dermatitis. And then for certain flares or certain acute flare-ups, you can use cyclosporin. And you only use cyclosporin in very acute settings. So you would only use it for a limited time, and you wouldn't want to use this for too long. And then you can use antihistamines to help with the puritis. And there's also some question of, well, does giving melatonin at night help with symptoms of atopic dermatitis or does it not? Or it's still not known at this point. There may be some evidence that it does, but we still need some more research on this. So just keep the melatonin in the back of your mind as a possible uh, mild aid um, in helping with these atopic dermatitis symptoms. So, so these are the main management and treatment goals. You want to avoid certain allergens, triggers, and certain foods if possible. You also want to think about the treatments and when to use them. Topical corticosteroids for mild cases, topical calcineurin inhibitors for certain areas of the body, phototherapy for severe disease, cyclosporin for acute flares, antihistamines for puritis, and maybe melatonin. So if you want to learn more about dermatological conditions, please check out my dermatology playlist. And if you haven't already, please consider liking, subscribing, and clicking the notification bell to help support the channel. And again, thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you next time.